Welcome to Postmark from the Stars. We're a science fiction bookstore, and with us today we have the legendary Jeff Noon. Uh, if you know anything about imaginative, big idea sci-fi, uh, you got to know about Vert. This book came out 30 years ago, and Jeff, I'm not going to lie, this is one of the hardest sci-fi books I've ever read, but oh my god, was it imaginative. Uh, it was insane, and uh, I don't know if I'm ever going to look at feathers the same way again, but uh, Jeff, how do you view Vert 30 years later? It all seems a bit like a kind of weird, mad dream now, looking back, that I was in at the time, you know. I mean, it's 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 a debut novel, and it's very much a debut novel for anyone who reads it. It's got that kind of energy that I associate with debut novels, which is like, you know, years and years of frustration and, and rejection slips and ideas and madness, and you think, okay, one last go, and then you just put everything into it all at once you know and it's you can't really control the flow of it because you don't know what you're doing you're learning how to write as you go and so it's an, it's it, thinking back it's like okay that that period of my life was very intense anyway it was the, written in the 90s in Manchester in England and then after a few years you kind of like oh god you know vert and all that and you move on and you do all the things and then a few years back, I realised that people still love the book. And I thought, OK, well, I should love the book again. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, I wrote it. I did that. And it, and it affects people to this day. And, uh, I, and so I come to terms with it. And I thought, yeah, yeah, I did it. <laughs> I did something mad. And it was mad. And what you said by it being difficult uh, or a difficult read or a hard read. I mean, I hope it's an exciting read. And I hope that it's got a... It it was exciting. It was it was yeah. Exciting. Writing it was a process of discovery, as I said, and it's just trying desperately to contain all that passion and energy that I felt at the time and my frustration, and just trying to get it down on the page in some kind of sense, you know, and then putting it out and seeing what people made of it. <laughs> well, you know, I'm I'm 32. I read it in 2023, and I can tell you, it still hits like a cinder block it is a heavy amazingly imaginative book um but you know when i reached out to you to interview you i was deeply interested in um you know it's it's got it's got some big ideas in it it's got this virtual um <laughs> metaphysical space that people travel to and when you think about um you know meta and you know the metaverse and all the money that was spent into creating a space people could, ex, uh, you know, escape to, if you will. And you think about Ready Player One and that, I mean, that was 2011 and you were you were playing with some of these ideas long before they became as mainstream as they are today. But um, I'm just curious, like, how do you see the development of, of uh, you know, the, the VR headsets? And they're, they're a little bit more commonplace when you think about like escaping to somewhere else. How do you think that impacts uh, Vert's legacy and kind of how you view it? Well, I'm of that generation uh, of readers who was overwhelmed by William Gibson's Neuromancer. That kind of blew us away, you know, at the time. And, and that introduces this idea of virtual reality into science fiction and into people's lives. By I wrote Vert in, what, 93? So it's about 10 years after that. Um, I knew when I wrote it that I, I didn't have a lot of interest in technology. I never have had. And I knew that I didn't want to create a way of accessing this world that was technical, that it was something else, that it had some kind of organic or even magical process to it that people didn't quite understand, which is, you know, which I invented this idea of these feathers that you tickle your mouth with and it gives you this dream experience. So it's very much for me, it's a dream experience. It's not... It's not a virtual reality as such. It's more, it's more like an ability to access the subconscious mind and the dream world. And, and as we all know, dreams can be amazing and great, good fun, but they can also be really nasty and, and weird. So you never quite know what you're going to get with virtual. So I think it's a bit hotter than something like Meta. It's not, it's not, it's a bit wilder than that. It's not, it's not, it's, 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 it's a kind of mad theatre, right? That's what I thought at the time. 
all I wanted to be was a theatre writer, a playwright. That was my dream. And that didn't work out. And I had a lot of plays and ideas. And I thought, well, virtual reality is a kind of theatrical space. OK, and, and that people might well treat it as such and, and the artists might create ideas for it. And as soon as I've got the idea of also connecting it to the dream world, you're thinking, OK, well, what if artists can create dreams that you can experience and then they can remix dreams and sample dreams and so on? Because a lot of the music of the time and the technology of that music goes into the book. Um, and so... When, when I mean, I, the, the whole idea of virtue of like putting the goggles on, it's such a private experience, that, and it kind of cuts you off from the world, you know. And I wanted this to be a shared experience so that groups of friends do it. In that sense, it's a bit like people taking a trip together, but I'm not really keen on the drug thing. But in, in the, it's the shared hallucination that's the best way of thinking about it. No, that's such a you know, <laughs> it. I think depending on your background and your life experiences, when you read Vert and you kind of learn about the role of the feathers and like you, you kind of can apply a lot of different meanings to that that escapism. So I, I think your your breakdown is well, obviously, you know, so on point. Um, you know, I feel like when I first started the book and I heard the name Scribble, I was just blown away by just how wildly inventive and 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 I know uh, Desdemona and all these different fun characters, but walk me through your inspiration for Scribble and like, how did you come up with him as a character? Well, he's me. <laughs> he's me in that first novel sense. You know what I mean? I'm not. It's not like a self insert, but you know, like the Smiths and like Morrissey songs, yeah, because that was very popular at the time as well. His characters were these kind of awkward. They were outsiders, but they weren't cool. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, they're the kind of young men and women who, who stand at the edge of the dance floor watching and they can't join in. And that was very much my life. And I think that a lot of writers probably share that kind of experience of being on the edges, watching and wanting to be part of it, but not being able to, you know. You bring that into your writing. So in that sense, it's me. It's like he's, he's like an uncool outsider. He doesn't quite know what he what he wants from life yet. He's too young. He's unformed. He's got a kind of great, great, great love for his sister, which goes beyond the bounds of any kind of normal love between brother and sister, which is, you know, something that he has to come to terms with. He comes from a very broken family. But he has this kind of courage that he always comes back to. He never stops his quest, you know. And all the way through my career, even to this day, a lot of my characters have that. They just don't stop. Even when it's ridiculously foolhardy for them to carry on, they never, ever stop. So I like that, you know, the uncool guy or gal who just can't join in and he's then forced to. It's like trying to have fun. You know, and the fun goes wrong and it turns into a nightmare. Yeah, we've all been there, right? When we, you know, you take that step, one step too far. Before you know it, you're in a place that you can't get get away from. How do you deal with that? And you're too young to know how to do it. You haven't got the the nouns to do it. You know, sure. so you you you're moving along by instinct, learning as you go making mistakes, learning from your mistakes, you know, relying on your friends to help you uh, for support and all that. So, yeah, part of a group, never actually managing to bond with them, always being on the outside of everything, you know. And I think that's why people like him probably, young, young people kind of relate to him, I think, in that way. Sure. Know? Yeah. So, so, Jeff, I'm... I'm... I want to make sure folks that are watching are like that audio cut out once or twice. Where are we? Uh, where are we uh, communicating from? I'm in Ohio right here in the United States. Where Where are you zooming from today? <clears throat> well, I live in Brighton now, which is on the south coast of Britain. Uh, I lived in Manchester uh, for the first 40 years of my life. And that very, very much comes out of Manchester, the city. It's a book about that city. Without a doubt, it was. It's a book that expresses my love for that city and the music and the people of that city. Um, 
and the streets, you know, everything about it. I wanted to make, to write a book that was, although it's going to go mad and very, very weird and quite dangerous, it's actually rooted in the everyday. So I named all the streets. I made all the buildings real and everything. I added a few little things in here and there, but ground the re ground the fantasy in that everyday urban environment of the kids on the street wanting to get up to and then let them just float away from there into this other world you know so the two for me that was very important that i made sure this was the real realist manchester i could make it and then just explode it into this phantasmagoria it makes it much more immersive and uh, i think the rave culture of the time it. yeah the rave culture of the time which was you know uh, like music of uh, Happy Mondays and groups like that and people taking ecstasy. So there was that feeling. You would go to these mad raves and everyone dancing and they're all off their heads and they're all... But they're just kids, you know, kids on the street. That's what they yeah. are. And um, so I wanted to put all of that into it, all that Manchester culture, yeah, and the bands and the music and everything and the drugs and everything, yeah. Well, you definitely did that very successfully. Um, I, I, I've been meaning to ask you this because... Whenever I get ready to interview an author, I just jump on, you know, YouTube and I look up other people's reviews of the book that I just finished. And I always find it fascinating because sometimes I feel like everyone's on like the same mental channel and they're all kind of espousing the same hot take on a book. One thing I found really interesting about Vert 30 years later is I don't know if right if readers have always been this way or maybe they just had this opinion and they kept it to themselves, but you know. There seem to be a lot of people with hot takes now that say things and they read this or they discover this type of activity or event happens in a book and they write it off or they they just say, like, I'm not going to touch that. That's not the kind of content I want to be exposed to or whatever. And I'm just kind of curious for like your response to folks that have an approach to maybe like a work like Vert um, and and. and like, how do you how do you approach when, when people kind of have that reaction to um, your work? It's a, it's, it's a difficult subject, you know. Um, I think that the 90s, that, that early 90s and late 90s, it was a very special period in Britain for culture. There was a lot of experimentation going on in, in like graphic novels with Alan Moore, Grant Morrison, in, in music, lots of remixing, lots of crazy stuff going on. And it was a kind of fearless time. You know, when I wrote Vert, I didn't have one ounce of fear in me. I didn't, I wrote, I just wrote. I didn't worry at all in any way ever about writing something that might be offensive, you know. For a start, I didn't think the book was going to do anything. It was written for a tiny little publisher before the internet in the analog years. <laughs> and it was the first batch of books that I'd ever put out. So, and I'd had a lot of failures in theatre. So this was like, OK, I'm just going to do this because nothing's going to happen. No one's going to read it. So there was no fear. And also the times there was no fear. And so but I understand that people's. Uh, it's changing and fashions come and go and, you know, and so on. Um, it's a bit like. I mean, if if the book offends you in some way, then, then please don't read it. You know, don't read it. I don't want to offend people. Right? And everybody needs to do what they want to do and have fun in the world. OK, it's not as as the game cat, what the character in it says, you know, be careful, be very, very careful. This is not for the weak. This trip is not for the weak, you know, and that, and, and that that's a warning there. It's. um. I'm used to watching horror films. I'm. I'm used to experiencing extreme art uh, from a young age. So for me, it was a kind of natural expression. Um, I I haven't, personally, I don't scour the internet looking at my own name, so I, I'm not sure who the people are that don't like it. And, but I know that in, people come up to me and they love it, okay, when I do events and that. So it does speak to them. It does speak. It's one of those, one of those books that doesn't speak to everyone. And I, I know that. But those that he does speak to, it speaks to utterly. You know, and that's always the kind of art me personally has been drawn to, you know, that 
something that's got a unique voice is very important and, and a style to it and, and he's willing to take risks in subject matter in form in, you know the way that it's written and and, and how the form and the content of a novel intermingle and clash against each other to create this thing so yeah i think that for me and also i think that the world that the characters live in and the experiences that they're on that they're going through because they're entering into this realm that is very dangerous because it's it's a kind of outpouring of the human subconscious mind of it needs, the book needed to have a kind of uh, a, a true exploration of that danger. Okay. If I was writing the book today, I'm 66, right? If I was writing the book today, would I put some of that stuff in? No, of course not. You know, I was a young man with no fear. Do you know what I mean? And I think that if you can take the book in that spirit, you'll be, it'll, it'll, it, you'll be good. It'll be good. Yeah. You know, you know I, yeah. that's, that's yeah. such a good way to cage it. Like I wrote this book without fear. Would I read it a little bit differently now? Probably, maybe. I mean, everybody Absolutely, would yeah. probably approach something differently thirty years or so later. Um, but you wrote, yeah, something. you change over time, you know. So yeah, it needs to be read about basically. But but I just I can't stress if you've never heard of Vert, or you or you maybe read Vert thirty years ago, or you just love cyberpunk, or just brilliant, out of the box challenge. Like it is challenge. Like I just think that like. To tell a reader like, oh, just casually read Vert. Like, you ain't going to read ca Vert casually. But but Jeff, I just want you to know, I've read hundreds of sci-fi books. I eat this stuff up like candy. This is a fun bit of candy. <laughs> so I want to thank you for writing this because it is such a spectacular piece of literature. No, thank you, man. That's, that's really good of you. Well, I appreciate you uh, hopping on a, uh, an interview with me. And uh, I just want you to know that... Uh, you you get me excited because I feel like I scour my genre of science fiction for all the crazy stuff, and I still find beautifully written delightful little gems, uh, like like this feathery feathery paperback right here, Vert. So uh, thanks again for for hopping on the show, and if you're interested in more uh, interviews and discussions with authors like Jeff Noon, please make sure to follow Postmark from the Stars. We might just be the greatest science fiction bookstore in the world. And if we're not, we're aspiring to be. So thank you for watching and uh, have a wonderful uh, rest of your day. Thanks.